After years of dominating the world of real-time strategy, Westwood Studios decided to take their defining franchise into other genres. In 2002, Command & Conquer entered the shooter space with Renegade, which met with a mixed reception. While some fans absolutely loved it, it couldn't attract any new converts to the series and underperformed some lofty expectations. While Renegade was in development, Westwood had set to work on a number of CNC projects across the entire range of gaming genres, from another shooter, to another RTS, to their first massively multiplayer online game. All of these were either cancelled or put on hold to focus attention on Earth and Beyond, an unrelated sci-fi MMO that did so poorly it sunk the company. Westwood's owners, Electronic Arts, decided it was time for a shakeup. And so they shut down Westwood, Westwood's sister studio in Irvine, California, and the DreamWorks Interactive team in LA, and combined them all into one new massive entity, Electronic Arts Los Angeles. Many fans cried foul, and it looked like it might be the end of the famous series. But on the contrary, EA still saw a lot of value in the franchise, and while new teams would be put to work on it, Command & Conquer still had life after Westwood's death. Westwood's sister studio in Irvine had almost finished work on a brand new Command & Conquer game before it got shut down and folded into EALA. This meant that right out of the starting gate, the new Super Studio had a major game and a major franchise to release. Command & Conquer Generals invaded stores in February 2003, a complete break from earlier titles. Generals took the original game's premise of civilized nations versus a decentralized terror organization and recast it in a more modern and more serious story world. And this time, the civilized world wouldn't be represented as one faction, but as two competitors, China and the United States. It eschewed the iconic FMV cutscenes for in-engine sequences devoid of the characters that had made those previous scenes so memorable. As such, the story was hands-off at best. Still, all three factions played differently, and the balance was spot on. It made for a game that was a hit with fans of the genre, but not necessarily with fans of the series. EA greenlit an expansion pack called Zero Hour. At the time, those members of Westwood who had opted to join EA LA were working on Command & Conquer 3. But their overlords had different priorities, and the crew was put to work on an expansion to a game they hadn't made in the first place. Zero Hour was well received and is considered by some fans to be among the best CNC games ever made. Sadly, according to some reports, it was the last straw. After Zero Hour was done, most former Westwood employees left EALA for good. They wanted to work on the games they wanted to again, and EA wasn't letting them do it. Though Westwood founder Lewis Castle would stay on, for the most part, Command & Conquer was in new hands. With Zero Hour complete, EA decided to turn back to the series that had started it all. When Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars finally did release in March 2007, it was the first game from the original storyline since 1999. And though it was a modern RTS, it returned to the conventions that made the earlier games such a success, including high-budget cutscenes with clear heroes and villains. The good guys would get their orders from the mighty Michael Ironside, a popular character actor famous to gamers as the voice of Splinter Cell's Sam Fisher. I could go either way, but that's not what's bothering me. Come here. InOps has been interrogating some not POWs, and they've come across a couple spotty similar threats here. For the bad guys, Joe Q. Can would return as gaming's original bald baddie, Kane. Once again, the world is quick to bury me. How could my own brothers believe that what transpired at the Temple Prime did not unfold exactly as I planned? Of course, I could not have planned for an ambush by my own forces! But old-time fans were in for a surprise. The two factions wouldn't be the only warring forces. A third alien party would enter the fray, and they were fully playable in the multiplayer and in a bonus campaign. 
Their introduction had always been a long-term objective of Westwood Studios, and a close examination of earlier games reveals references to these alien invaders long before they were an official part of the canon. It was a solid return to form. Sticking so close to its predecessors, it shouldn't come as a surprise that it suffered the same criticism, namely that CNC3 didn't do anything really new. It was modern, polished, and beautiful, but it was also the same old thing. But while that criticism was being leveled, EA was secretly working on something completely different. Tiberium was a first-person shooter well on its way to completion. It would be a squad-based game that would feature only one gun. The trick was that the gun could transform into different modes, assault rifle, anti-aircraft, or whatever the player needed. In many ways, it was a bold move, not least because it wouldn't have Command & Conquer in the title. But in 2008, when the game was pretty much done, EA canceled it. Even with all the money spent on the project, during an internal review, Electronic Arts had determined that the game's quality was just too low to warrant wasting the marketing dollars. Despite all the attempts to evolve Command & Conquer into different genres, it always seemed to come back to the same one, the one it had defined in the first place, real-time strategy. And so going forward, EA would dig up another abandoned storyline and breathe new life into it, while at the same time bidding farewell to the tale that started it all. Tune in next time to see the sun set on Command & Conquer.